Okay, so um, I'm going to try to make this interactive, make sure that you all feel really comfortable with foundational concepts, and then we're going to go and use that when we talk about epithelial tissue. Okay, so we're going to take a step back. And uh, it's okay. So as I mentioned, you're going to have four major tissue types that you're going to be hearing about between this week, among this week and next week. Um, we're going to start with epithelial tissue, going to connective muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. So everything will fit into this classification of tissues. Right? So if I say to you, OK, what type of tissue is cartilage? And you would say it's a specialized connective tissue. Okay? What you have is you should appreciate that epithelial tissue you're going to have basically cell-cell contact, a little bit, if not, uh, maybe not existing at all, extracellular matrix between them. Whereas connective tissue, the cells live in a sea of extracellular matrix, right? And you have specialized connective tissue. You'll have the cartilage. You'll have bone, okay? What do you think blood is? A specialized connective tissue. In this case, the extracellular matrix is liquid versus a solid extracellular matrix that you see in uh, connective tissue proper as well as cartilage and bone. Then you have muscle, contractile tissue, and nervous tissue sensory. Okay. But I want to take a step back and make sure that you just appreciate nomenclature. So histological terminology. So in the anatomy lab, you'll talk about frontal, coronal plane. You'll see Dr. Uh, Pravitz will introduce that. Okay. It's the anatomical positioning as you view a, an individual, okay, palms forward and so forth. In histology, the terms are really, we're going to be talking about transverse sectioning, a cross section of a tube, versus a longitudinal sectioning. 
And your job is to, again, think about the three-dimensionality of a given structure. And what would it look like if I did a cross-section versus a longitudinal section? So for example, if we have a tube, like a blood vessel, right? Easy tube. And I did a cross-section of that tube, I may get this circular profile. And what do I see in that circular profile? So, so one of your jobs. One of your jobs is to be able to say, OK, this is a lumen of the vessel. Right, OK? And here's the wall of the, the vessel. And so what we're looking at, this is the lumen. right? And then you have the wall. So that gives you an idea of a cross-sectional profile. Orient yourself. In some cases, a cross-sectional profile may give you a flavor of where you exist. For example, if I look at the spinal cord, and we section through the spinal cord, and you section at the top here, you notice the structure. You have the gray matter inside, which you'll become comfortable with these terms as we go through with the nervous system, white matter. But look at the structure in the cervical sectioning of that spinal cord versus the sacral sectioning of the spinal cord. You see that? So understanding the anatomy will, will also help you understand the histology of these two profiles, cross-sectional profiles. Same thing, Dr. Kravitz in the anatomy will introduce today bone. And we'll talk about the, the uh, diaphysis and the epiphysis of bone. And the idea is that if you were to do a cross section okay, of the epiphysis, okay, you may get a section that looks like this, versus if we do a cross section in the diaphysis of the bone, you get more of an open cavity. So again, depending where you're sectioned, you will get a different histological image. That's why sectioning is very important and understanding terminology. Make sense so far? Yes? OK, I need that one person. OK. And I would even, if I cross-section an artery versus a vein, arteries, the, 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 that portion of the vascular system, okay, have thick walls and also an elastic laminar. So when you section it, it tends to retain its shape or maintain its shape, whereas veins a lot of times will collapse a lot thinner wall when you think of the musculature. Okay? So again, when they come in pairs, it's sometimes easy to identify the artery versus that vein uh, part of that vascular tree. Longitudinal section, so if I have a vessel and I'm cutting down in the longitudinal plane, look what may happen. You may have the lumen and the walls, but I also may just get the wall, you see? And the size of the lumen may change depending if I'm sectioned in the center or more periphery. So start training your eyes with respect to how that section was done. It will make your life a lot easier. And with these are the type of discussions you can have upstairs. So here is a section. And if I look at this, a lot going on here, but you can appreciate that right here, here's a cross-section of vasculature. You all see that? OK? So immediately, down here, now is there any other profiles of vasculature? Well, this also looks like a, a maybe a cross-section or it's starting to be an oblique section in between longitudinal cross-section. And I can follow this down. Well, look at this. This is the wall of the vessel. I'm going next to it. You see how it travels down and so forth? You all appreciate that? So what they have done is they've caught right here a glancing blow. In fact, if you look, these are probably erythrocytes within that blood vessel. So this is like a longitudinal section going, so this is in plane, out of plane, in plane. So remember, when tissues are sectioned, the vessel doesn't say, let me make your life easier and just straighten out. It's wavy. So you can have the same vessel sectioned in plane, out of plane, in plane. You see that? So that's what you want to start to appreciate when you start looking at histological sections. 
Okay. Here we have, uh, basically, here is a profile of the blood vessel. And this is actually a profile of nerve. And when you look at that, you'll hear that nerve represents cut axons. And this is a bundle of cut axons. And if we focus on this, again, the axons could be, it's wavy. So when you do a section of it, you may get a circular profile. This is the axon inside, myelin sheath outside. Or this is the area of longitudinal cut of axons. Okay. So again, appreciate that you may be looking at longitudinal cross sections uh, from different perspectives. Dr. Ellinger will talk about this, but appreciate now is if you're looking at smooth muscle, okay, and you have a spindle-shaped cell, centrally placed nuclei, what would I expect to see in cross-section if I cross-section it here? What do I expect to see? What? OK, so you will have the membrane, no nuclei. But what would I expect to see here? Nuclei, so maybe a larger section with a nucleus in between, right? And so when you look here, these are longitudinal profiles of smooth muscle. Here are the nuclei, and we'll talk about staining characteristics in a second. And then up here is transverse, or same as cross sections of smooth muscle. And you'd appreciate this cross section has a nucleus in present. But these profiles do not have nuclei present. You see that? So that kind of gives you a flavor of how that cell is shaped. So when you section it, what you expect to see. OK? OK, so if I did a section just like this, a cross section that's coming down like this, right? This one will have a nucleus present. Up here would not. OK? OK. Other terminology, proximal versus distal. It's all relative of where you're starting from, say. So this is quite, you say, well, this makes a lot of sense. If we talk in the kidney, we have a glomerulus. It's going to be a tuft of capillaries. And you have a filtrate that occurs. So filtration is going in this direction. Well, what is it going into? It's going into a tubular system, right? So if the filtrate starts here, like so, then this is the proximal tubule segment. Right? And then as it travels, it goes to the distal tubule segment. So you say, okay, that makes perfect sense. However, in nature, this is not what the architecture looks like in the kidney. It's all folded up. So now you have to orient yourself and say, this is the glomerulus. Filtration is starting up here, so this is the proximal segment. And then it goes all through this tubule, and now it's at the distal segment, although Anatomically, that distal segment is still a cr closely approximated to the glomerulus. You see that? But it's all based on flow and not just the anatomical positioning. Okay? So that's where you want to start getting the flavor of. The terms efferent and afferent, okay, to carry. Afferent to carry to. Efferent to carry away. So if you think about that, it's all relative to your frame of reference. In this case, we're talking about lymph nodes. Okay? And if you look at lymph nodes, you have lymph vessels that are carrying lymph into the lymph node. So this lymph vessel is an afferent lymph vessel. It's carrying it to this lymph node. Now, lymph percolates through and leaves that lymph node through an efferent lymph vessel. You see that? However, that efferent lymph vessel draining into another lymph node, a second lymph node. 
So that efferent lymph vessel relative to lymph node 1 becomes the afferent lymph vessel relative to lymph node 2. Okay? And you'll hear these terms, especially in neuroscience, where they'll talk about afferent and efferent axons and so forth. Okay? So get that nomenclature down. It's just relative. Staining, really important in histology. If something is acidophilic, okay, so structures that stain with acid dyes such as eosin, so we typically say eosinophilic. So what structures that stain with acid dyes are structures that when the staining is done, okay, are basically basic. So what we have, collagen. Collagen is a major component of the extracellular matrix outside the cell. So you may see out here, a lot of these fibers here are collagen fibers because that outside world is staining. It's not just an empty space. Also, complex two or cytochrome C, players of the electron transport chain, so mitochondria, stain very eosinophilic. It gives a pinkish hue to it. Okay? Major basic protein. We'll come into that in a second. Obviously, it's a very basic protein. And so it's picking up that dye, eosin, which gives a pink color too. Whereas anything that's basophilic are structures in the ionized state that stain with a basic dye, such as hematoxylin. In our case, we're going to say hematoxylin is a basic dye. Okay? It acts like a basic dye. And so any acidic material, so what's going to stain very basophilic? Give a blue structure, uh, a color to it. DNA. DNA. So nuclei are going to stain very basophilic. Or any cell that has an extensive amount of uh, RNA, okay, is going to stain very basophilic. And you'll see this throughout. Understanding this concept will make your life easy throughout the course. Okay? So what you can appreciate here, when we look at this epithelial lining, you can see these circular profiles are the nuclei. Okay? So these are staining very basophilic, whereas the cytoplasm is staining more eosinophilic. This is an H and E stain. Now, in some cases, you can appreciate that on the right-hand side, this is a transmission electron micrograph. And a transmission electron micrograph is going to give you the ultrastructure of cell, just a, a higher resolution. And you can appreciate that this is nuclei, and then you have these granules. And you see these granules. Whenever you see something that's very unique, I would probably just write it down, unique, okay? Because it tells you what cell you're looking at. This particular gran this granules with this crystalline core center, it's actually a crystalline core composed of major basic protein. So what, how is it going to stain? Acidophilic or basophilic? Huh? Acidophilic, okay? So here, this is that electron micrographic image, and this is a light micrographic image of an eosinophil, hence the name, okay? And see, this is the nucleus, and all these granules are staining very eosinophilic. Make sense? So understanding will help you understand the composition of granules. So here, you can appreciate, again, when you look at a histological section, you would say, oh, I have a lumen out here. Okay? And so that means I have a surface of epithelial tissue. That's the apical surface. This is the basal surface down here. And we're going to talk about these terms when we get into epithelial tissue in a second. And you see you have your nuclei that are quite evident, very basophilic. And then we have these areas here, these granules. Would you say they're staining eosinophilic, basophilic, or fairly neutral? What would you want to say? Okay. Well, to me, okay, if this is basophilic and this is eosinophilic, they look fairly neutral. They're really not picking up the stain as readily as the other components. Now, if it's not picking up the stain, why is it not picking up the stain? Is it because it's not there or because something is preventing the stain from binding? What's the answer? The latter. Okay? In some cases, 
You may have preparations where there are artifacts where the entity has been lost, or in some cases like this, where the entity is there, something is preventing the stain from binding. In this case, this is, these are goblet cells. These are granules containing mucin. And mucin is a heavily glycosylated protein. And all those sugar groups are preventing the staining from binding. So you, do you think we can find another stain that will hi highlight those mucin granules? And what's the answer? Absolutely. So whenever you see new stains, appreciate we can use PAS, periodic acid shifts, which will stain preferentially for polysaccharides. So now it's the exact same image stained with PAS, and look at these goblet cells. Become very magenta-like staining. That's histology. So appreciate if you see a PAS stain, you know now what the target is. Other techniques that you will hear about in the, in the course is, again, I told you, there's brand new sections that you haven't seen. Second years haven't even seen these from, from last year. Okay? We put in about 12 new sections. And what it's done is that we've used antibodies to highlight, to decorate, because there are structures inside the cell that we can't see by conventional uh, light microscopy. So we have to decorate them with antibodies or other tools. And if we do that, we can actually have an antibody that's using a fluorescent or a histochemical component to it. And now we'll be able to visualize it either by immunofluorescent or immunohistochemistry. So here, I can appreciate that these are epithelial cells. They're connected together by desmosomes. We'll get into that in a second. And the desmosomes are co connected to intermediate filament. Okay, keratin. And the green is what's being highlighted are antibodies against keratin fibers. So you can really appreciate that interconnection of all these epithelial cells. What do you think if that keratin is dysfunctional? What do you think may happen? Will these connection points maintain integrity or probably become abnormal? Become abnormal, okay? And so we're going to get into that in, in a second. And so that's how we can identify. And in the lab, you'll see a lot of immunohistochemical stains now that are used specifically for given tissues. OK. Histological features. To diagnose and guide therapy in clinical practice, you need to identify changes in gross microscopic appearance of cells and tissues. We just said that definition earlier, right? So what are you to look at in histology? Look at nuclear positioning and shape. The shape of the nucleus dictates the shape of the cell. Okay? Is it basal? Is it apical? Is it in the center? Look at the chromatin pattern. Is it euchromatic, meaning that it is very active in translation processes and gene expression? Or is it heterochromatic, highly condensed chromatin? Okay? That can make a change of whether you're looking at a normal epithelial lining or maybe one that's dysplastic to cancerous, okay? because the shape of the nuclei change. And that's how they do things like pap smears. You look at the chromatin change in the nuclei. Okay? Look at the cells approximated to each other, to each, to each other and to the lumen. So here, okay, here is a lumen. Would you say? that the cells are closely touching each other out here? And what would you say? Absolutely. How about down here? Nuclei, nuclei. Do you think they're touching each other? No. Epithelial tissue, connective tissue. Is this, do you see any blood vessels here? No. Do you see blood vessels down here? Okay, this is, these are red cells. Okay, so one may be avascular and something is vascular. These are the different points that you want to highlight throughout the course. So look at the amount of extracellular matrix. Okay, So there's little extracellular matrix among epithelial tissue, but a lot within connective tissue. Cell matrix ratio, we'll get that into that in a second, very important, as well as the vascular content. Epithelial tissue is avascular, cartilage is avascular, bone is very vascular, connective tissue proper is very vascular, muscle very vascular. Okay. Okay. 
So here, here they used a Mallory stain, which stains connective tissue. Okay? So if I come up here and I have a, a, a thing, notice I, uh, I tend to pick on people in the back. They make me work. There you go. She's looking down. Okay. Point to the area of dense connective tissue. She's, she's down. There you go. Okay. It's dense connective tissue. So now, okay, so she's right. This is dense connective tissue. Point to the area of loose connective tissue. There you go. Okay. Based on that, which has a higher nuclei, uh, amount of nuclei present? What would you say? Loose or dense? Loose. Looks like loose. If it looks like it, it probably is. That's histology. Okay? <laughs> there you go. If the stain is staining the, the fibers, collagen fibers, turquoise, okay, which has more fibers present, the loose or the dense? The dense. You see that? Okay? That's histology. So dense connective tissue has a high fiber to cell ratio, and loose connective tissue has a high cell to fiber ratio. It becomes obvious. You can move on. Dr. Uh, Newman will talk about that even further when he does connective tissue. But that's histology. Okay? Here, this is muscle, striated muscle. And you can appreciate in this particular striated muscle that this plasma membrane probably goes like this. Yeah. Okay? The nuclei, central or peripheral. This is the nucleus. It's peripheral. It's towards the side, right? So here's one type of striated muscle, peripheral nuclei. Here is another type of striated muscle. has striations in it. And look at this particular cell. So this is the protein in this cell. Is that nucleus central or peripheral? Central. That determines, are you looking at cardiac or are you looking at skeletal muscle? You see what you're supposed to be focusing on? That's histology. Okay. Describe the features you see here. Yell it out. What's that? Well, so this is a cell. What would you say? OK, cells are cuboidal. What else? There's a lumen. What else? It's avascular. What else? Nuclei are spherical. What else? They're attached to each other, the cell, right? So what we're looking at, basically, you're defining the properties of epithelial tissue. OK? So if you look at this, you would say, oops, OK, that the spherical, there's a closely approximated, almost no extracellular matrix. There's a lumen, so there's pol polarized, apical versus the basal side. OK, nuclei is spherical. This is what you want to say. So feel comfortable of saying what you see. OK, in some cases, it may be the sectioning is throwing you off. That's where our discussion comes in in the module session. OK, do you have a flavor of where the histology course is going and what, what tools you need? OK, you guys happier? OK, we'll get there. <laughs> OK, now what we're going to do is on one of those tissues, and we're going to bring in some of these players, epithelial tissue. So these are the section objectives. You can read it. It's posted on the LCMS Plus, and these are good tools to be able to focus, you know, to guide you. But remember, staining is very important. If we talked about PAS already and H&E, feel comfortable. Every time there's a new stain, Make sure you understand it. We're going to start talking about different types of microscopy. Make sure you feel comfortable with that. It's all visual, okay? And that's what's nice about the course here. So this is my cartoon. And, and what I try to tell you or relate to you is that if you think about it, the human body is all made up of tubes, right? Okay, you have the, the skin makes up the outer coating, and then you can have the respiratory system, an open-ended tube to a closed sac. Okay? The uh, urinary system, 
closed sac, open-ended tube. The digestive system, open-ended tube, open-ended tube. And when you go down that lining of the tube, depending on where you are in the body, the composition of that lining changes. You eat something, quick, you want to come to lecture because you're so excited to be here, okay? You chew quickly, sharp edges, goes into the esophagus. You want a lining that's protective so it doesn't cut, right? And it's not going to bleed, there's no, it's avascular, right? So you want a thick lining. But you go into the stomach, you want a lining that A, will secrete acid, but also is protective, so you need some type of mucus down there. But you go into the small intestines, you want a lining that allows for absorption of all the nutrients, right? So even though it's a tube, your job is you close your eyes, eventually, okay, when we start talking about systems, how does that lining change relative to function? Okay? So when we do that, we get a tube. So we did a, a tube, and again, I always try to orient myself. Here's the lumen. If this is the lumen and the lumen of all tubes coming from the outside, the skin is specialized epithelial tissue, the oral cavity, epithelial tissue, the esophagus, lined by epithelial tissue, right? All tubes are lined by epithelial tissue. And if I do that, there's polarity against that epithelial cell. You have what's called the apical side. The apical side is facing the lumen. And then you have the basal side. And the basal side is opposite. The basal side is actually being attached to the underlying connective tissue. Now, the blue represents the connective tissue. And then you have this red interface. And the red is a specialized extracellular matrix known as the basement membrane. And it allows the epithelial cells to attach to the basement membrane, which is attached to the connective tissue proper. So it allows for attachment. OK? And so here is what you, you know, just terminology we want you to feel comfortable with. The lateral sides are typically known as the basal lateral wall. And you'll see why it's called basal lateral. The lateral sides are mostly continuous with the basal sides. Now, every time I talk about generalizations, depending on what cell type you talk about, there could be some caveats that we throw, uh, throw in down the road. The other thing I want to highlight is that this is showing some connective tissue. We have some muscle. But we also have this little tube. And this little tube, I should show you, is also lined by epithelium, but it's going to be very thin, known as squamous. Okay? And so sometimes when we talk about epithelial cells, I will ask you what type, what cell it is, you will say epithelium. In other cases, you may give it a specific name. If this is a blood vessel, that tube now, which is the closed tube, not going to the outside, that, blood, that tube is lined by a specialized epithelial layer known as endothelium. So if I use the term endothelium, you immediately know it's blood vessels, OK? And also lymphatic vessels, OK? So we talk about endothelium. Endo. In contrast, if that tube is free standing in the cavity, it's also lined by an epithelium known as mesothelium. So the outer portion of some tubes are also squamous epithelium, and those are mesothelium. And we'll go into them in a second. Okay, So there are specific nomenclature you have to feel comfortable with. OK. So quick definitions. This is now rehashing what we just said. So epithelial tissue lines the surface of the body and tubes or passages leading to the exterior. That's a given. Okay? What the, ep the epithelium is doing is separating the external environment from the underlying connective tissue. In essence, it's almost like the plasma membrane right, of a cell. It separates the outside from the inside of a cell. The epithelium is separating the outer environment from the inner cavity. And there's ways to protect the body from infections. And we'll go into that throughout. Okay? But it's a very stringent lining. So we just said, you go into any type of these tubes, you can have this type of epithelial surface looks fairly smooth from this magnification. Or you can have an epithelial surface that looks like uh, areas of projections, right? Well, 
This is to allow for passage of some entity. Okay? In this case, it could be air going through the lungs, and this could increase surface area for absorption. So epithelial morphology will change, or structures will change that the epithelium sit on. And you'll become the experts on that. Here is uh, a nice area, so you'll feel comfortable. This is the lumen. Again, this is from the out, so this is the lumen. I can tell you right off that this is cartilage, so I know I'm in the respiratory system. So I'm taking air in. The epithelium, okay? If I was to look at this and I ask the question, so here, take the pointer. Point to the apical surface, okay, if this is the lumen, where's the apical surface of the epithelial cell? Where? Is it working? No, keep it on. Right there, apical surface, exactly right. Where's the basal surface? Perfect. Okay? So that's the key. Apical, basal. And sometimes you see these like little projections on the apical surface. Those are structures we will talk about. Those are apical projections. And you have to know what are they. But what I also like is if you go down here, look how this surface invaginates. You see that? Because when we talk about glands, exocrine glands, exocrine glands are glands that secrete the product into a duct and makes its way out into the lumen of the bigger cavity. So if this is the respiratory tract, we have glands, these are glands down here that are continuous with this ductal system out here. Okay? So now you're starting to put down, put together different features. So epithelial tissue not only lines the surface of the body, but lines many of the free surfaces of the outer wall. So for example, in the digestive tract, if this is the luminal area, and this is all epithelial tissue, out here, which is in freestanding, is a epithelial layer known as the mesothelium, okay? which is a simple squamous epithelium. Epithelium forms specialized structures in the form of glands, and we just talked about that. So if this is the lumen, this is the duct, and this is the secretory components of glands, so glands secrete the material into the secretory portion of the gland, and that material travels through the ductal portion of the gland into the lumen. Okay? So that kind of gives you a flavor. It's all continuous from the outer surface, so it's all epithelial tissue. Notice, do you think these cells here secrete the same product in the secretory portion, what's shown here? Do you think they're the same cells or different? How do you know the difference? The nucleus. This one is spherical. This is flattened. How else do you know it's different? The staining. This is eosinophilic. This is neutral. Which one is probably have a lot of mucus present, containing that mucin? The one flattened or circular? Flattened, because of the staining characteristic, right? So just by a cartoon, you now know that this is a secretory unit that's secreting both a heavily glycosylated protein entity or a poorly glycosylated protein entity into this lumen and makes its way out. You see how you can pick up information just from a cartoon? Okay? Okay. And you should do the same when you look at a histological structure. Epithelial cells are closely approximated, having only small or none epicellular matrix between them. Okay? And so when we went to this tube, we, you, you were describing epithelial tissue. Cell boundaries are uh, seen. Nuclei are provident. Nuclei are basophilic. Some eosinophilic uh, material seen. Cells are closely packed together. Cells are arranged in a tubular fashion, and cells are cuboidal. So we just described epithelial lining of tubes, in this case, in the kidney. Okay? Okay. And epithelial tissue is avascular. So we keep coming back from that. Okay. Functions of epithelial tissue, well, that depends on location. Would I memorize this list? I want you to understand it. Makes sense, right? Protection, skin, abrasion, esophagus, right? Anal rectal junction, stomach, secretion, absorption, kidney, intestine, and so forth. Movement, respiratory tract, we'll talk about that. 
expandability as you sit here, okay? That epithelial lining is expanding as we talk now, right? After the lecture, you'll have it contracted again, maybe. Okay. Uh, even taste, olfactory vision, specialized neuroepithelial cells. And so you'll be touching upon these as we go through the course. So nomenclature is quite simple in some cases. Okay, you'll see. So nomenclature is based on shape of a cell and number of layers. So what would this nomenclature be? Simple squamous. It's simple because it means it's one layer of cells. And they're sitting on the basement membrane. Every cell is sitting on the basement membrane. So therefore, it's simple, squamous. The red is the basement membrane. They're attachment sites, right? Now, it could just be a simple squamous epithelium, or it could be endothelium. Where does that surface live? Blood vessels. Or it could be mesothelium, right? Now, if I was to take an endothelial cell and a mesothelial cell and hand it to him, and but they're not labeled, and pick it up, could he tell morphologically which is which? No, because they're both simple squamous epithelium, right? Could he tell functionally, if I describe functions, which is which? Yes, because they live in different places. So you have to be given information to know what you're looking at, either from a functional perspective or location in some cases. Make sense? OK? So don't lose sleep. How would I know? Sometimes you won't. So that's a simple squamous. What type of epithelium is, is this? Simple cuboidal. What about this? Simple columnar. Now, I have an epithelium like this, this guy here, okay? This one. What type of epithelium is that? Stratified cuboidal. Make sense? It's only the basal cells are sitting on that basement membrane. And the other cells are sitting attached to the cells sitting on the basement membrane. Make sense? So it's a stratified layer. What about next to it? What type of epithelium is that? Why is it stratified squamous? Name from the apical cell. And so therefore, how do you know that this is the lumen out here then? Because the basement membrane gave directionality, right? Something is going to give you information. And so that means these are the basal cells. It's stratified, but the nomenclature is based on the most apical cell. So it's stratified squamous epithelium. Then we have specialized epithelium, which basically looks stratified, but these cells now are dome-like at the apical. And these are, this is known as transitional. It's transitional because this is only found in the urinary system, in the bladders and ureters. And as the bladder expands, these cells flatten out. So it allows for expandability. Okay? So the only time you'll have transitional epithelial is, uh, epithelium is in the urinary system. They have dome-shaped epithelial cells at the apical. What's this? It's a pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Why is it pseudostratified? <laughs> right. It's the heights. Okay? <coughs> the heights of the cells are different. And if the heights are different, the nuclei placement is different. So it looks stratified, but all the cells are sitting on the basement membrane. So it's really a simple epithelium. Okay? The problem here is could you look at a section and tell me that it's stratified versus pseudostratified? No. You will just have to know that in the respiratory system or in the male reproductive system, it's a pseudostratified epithelium. So that's a case where you just have to know what system you're looking at by some other cues and then know that, what type of epithelium. So what type of epithelium is A? Simple cuboidal. What is B? 
simple squamous. Now, sometimes the nuclei bulges out into the lumen. Okay? So that gives you an idea. So you guys are becoming the expert. What type is now? In some cases, you'll have linings okay, that when you peruse it, wow, it looks pretty stratified here. But if I go high in magnification, what does this look like? What would you say right here? Simple columnar. So sometimes you have to peruse the epithelium to make your call because when you section tissue, and we'll go into this later on, you'll generate artifacts or tissues will collapse and so forth. So you may get a crowding of nuclei, which is not normally there. So this is an example of a simple columnar. And you don't, have, you don't go simple columnar, stratified, simple, and everything. It's typically one epithelium unless you have a transition point. What type of epithelium? Okay, what type of epithelium is seen in this light micrograph? See? So there I have to tell you, what type of epithelium is this like a micrograph which was taken from the respiratory tract? You see? Everyone you're yelling at pseudostratified epithelium. Okay? And again, here is the basement membrane. Here is the apical surface, has cilia. Cilia is linked to pseudostratified. Here's another giveaway that you'll hear about. Okay? And the nuclei look at different heights, but again, all the cells are sitting on the basement membrane. Okay? So a sheet, bless you, a sheet of epithelia, they all have a single basement membrane. Do all the cells necessarily sit on that basement membrane? Okay, in generality term, not, not a specific one. Do all, in every single epithelium, do all, you have a, is there a fair statement to say that you have a single basement membrane with a sheet of epithelia? That's a fair statement. Do all cells necessarily sit in that basement membrane? No, because in stratified, it doesn't. Okay? Again, so this is how you want to distinguish what you're looking at. Okay. Here, I tell you if this is the lumen, this is a cuboidal epithelium. How do I know? Because I can't see boundaries between cells, but you can draw a line between nuclei, right? <coughs> so if this is nuclei like this, I say, ah, oh, now what do I have? I have cuboidal, right? So this is a simple cuboidal epithelium. But I want you to look now on this structure. What is that structure? Okay, the structure and this structure are, these are blood vessels. Now look, this is cuboidal epithelium. Look here. This, these, see these squamous nuclei? Very thin. Those are your endothelial cells. Okay? It's the lining of the blood vessel. So this is a blood vessel. This is an artery. You see how it maintains its shape? This is a vein. It's starting to collapse. Okay? Blood was kind of caught in these sections. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute. You said that the nuclear shape dictates the cell, right? So if it's squamous, this is squamous. Makes sense. But look up here. These guys don't look squamous. They kind of look bunched up because the vein is collapsing. So that squamous cell is bulging up, right? So it's still a simple squamous endothelial lining in the native state. But because we sectioned it, you may not see it that way, but you know that this is endothelium because this is blood vessels. Veins and arteries tend to travel together. And so start appreciating what they look like as you go through. OK. Excellent. So that's an introduction to epithelium. Now, epithelial tissue, in many cases, is a polarized cell. Right? Why? Probably in all cases. <coughs> Why is it a polarized cell? Well, here is, is, is dramatic. Here's a simple epithelium. Once again, here's the lumen. Okay? So the basal lamina, we'll cut into that. The basal lamina is a subset of the basement membrane, but it allows for attachment. But you notice that's what's shown here is that the proteins and lipids on the apical surface are different than the proteins and lipids on the basal, basal lateral surface. You see that? And so what we have is these, we have these molecular fences that prevents the movement of lipids and proteins. It controls um, uh, parasites uh, uh, trans, uh, uh, in between the transport between cells. Okay, so you can have uh, transcytosis and parasitosis. So this controls movement between cells. Um, so we're going to talk about these molecular fences. But we're also going to talk about the apical specializations, and we're going to talk about the attachment sites at the basal level. 
Okay? So that's where we're going to go now, to talk about different sides of this epithelial tissue. So <clears throat> when we talk about epithelium, once again, we have the sheet of epithelial cells. sitting on the basement membrane, like so. We have junctional complexes that will sit. Now, in many cases, those exist as in the apical portion of the lateral wall. So they're sometimes called apical complexes. Again, it depends what type of epithelium. In endothelial cells, it's a little different. Okay, But these are junctional complexes. But what I'm showing here is that we have, in some, kinds, some cases, these apical specializations. And those apical specializations have certain functionality to them. In some of the cells, you will actually see that we may have actin filaments, which is a cytoskeletal structure Dr. Freed will talk about. And these actin cables give structural support for these finger-like projections. And all you're doing, okay, and then there's also actin going around, and all these are doing is increasing the surface area of the plasma membrane. So you could imagine if you want to increase the absorption. So let's say that you have transporters that are sitting here, and you want to bring in nutrients. Well, what's going to absorb more? If you have that or if you have an excessive amount of these in these structures, right? You would have a lot more. So it's increasing surface area, and these areas are known as villi. Okay? So villi are basically a projection of the apical surface and has actin cables to give it morphological structure to it. If I was to cross-section that by an electron micrograph to really to see those actin cables, can't see it by light microscopy, what type of profile would I see? This is still, uh, this is microvilli, actin cables. Think about it. What would I expect? Would I have a plasma membrane? And you would say, yeah, because plasma membrane surrounds everything. Would I have actin cables inside? Sure. They would look like little dots, right? That's what they would look like. In contrast, you can have apical, okay, and, and these are only about one micron. So you may be able to see them at the light microscope at the micro, uh, level, but they have to be in certain places like the digestive tube, where there's a lot of them, or in the kidney. In other cases, you have these apical projections that are much longer, and now they contain microtubules. And microtubules, as Dr. Freed will talk about, Microtubules are important for movement. Okay? There are little molecular motors, dynenes and kinesins, and those molecular motors will utilize microtubules like railroad tracks and take cargo from point A to point B. In these structures known as cilia, the cargo are adjacent microtubules. And what they are important for is, and he'll talk about it, is the beating. Micro, uh, the cilia will beat. Okay. So if I was to do an electron micrograph of these structures, you would see they have a plasma membrane around it as well. Plasma membrane. And now what you would have is microtubules in that 9 plus 2 conformation that Dr. Freed will talk about. So this is where it will blend in with his cytoskeletal lecture. 9 plus 2 means you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Throw in a couple more. 9 doublets with two central core microtubules. Okay? So when you start seeing these structures, you should be able to discern, are you looking at a cell with an apical projection of, of microvilli or of cilia? Okay. Does this make sense? So let's look at them from microscopy. This is a scanning electron micrograph. A scanning electron micrograph gives you three-dimensionality. 
So you can close your eyes at night and smile because you see how the big picture is working. So if this is from the gut and you just digested your food, you can appreciate that these are epithelial cells. This is the apical portion. This is the basal portion sitting on this specialized area of the basal laminar. Okay? Notice that you have this apical projections. These are microvilli increasing the surface area for absorption. If you did a transmission electron micrograph where you're now coming through the cell, you can appreciate the finger-like projections. You see these little lines. These are the actin cables to allow for structural uh, uh, support. And again, on the plasma membrane, which you're not picking up very readily here, will surround all of these projections. It's all continuous. If you were to do a cross section, or if you were to think about a cartoon, this is what it looks like. Plasma membrane goes up, down, up, down. And you have these actin cables that come down and interact with other actin areas. Okay? Do, uh, I took out a lot of the names because you really just don't need to know the nomenclature of all the players that are there. And this is what it will look like in cross section. Here's the plasma membrane and all the dots inside of the actin cable. Make sense? And important is that it's important for increasing surface area to allow for nutritional content, say, in the GI. So why is this important? Here is a case, which you hear in pathology, where here you have some epithelial cells of the, of the uh, intestines. Okay? And you see you have these nice microvilli. But in some cases, you'll have patients that have allergies to glutenin. Right? And what happens? They become malabsorptive. Why? Because look, on the right-hand side, now you're starting getting a disappearance of these microvilli. And so they're not absorbing properly. So this is an example, say, of celiac disease, okay? where you have antibodies that are generated, and you get a destruction of that architecture of the apical surface. So these are really important specializations. The other structure that we talked about was cilia. Now cilia the, are much larger in projection. They're found in the respiratory tract and male reproductive system. Okay? Uh, here, you can appreciate that all these projections are the cilia. Now, I told you that they come from, they, they, inside of them, the central core, are microtubules. Dr. Fried will tell you that microtubules in the cell proper all originate from a specialized area called the microtubule organizing center. Okay? In, the pro in the cell proper, it's the centrosome made up of centrioles. The microtubules that come into the cilia are coming from their own little microtubule organizing centers known as basal bodies. So if you see the term basal bodies, you will appreciate that underneath each of these cilia are these little microtubule organizing centers where the microtubules are radiating from. Okay. So this is a light micrograph of cilium, and this is a scanning electron micrograph of cilium. Question, do all cells in this epithelial sheet have cilia on top? And what's the answer? No. OK. How do I know? Well, it's very difficult from this side. But it's not as difficult if you look at the scanning EM. Okay, It's kind of like these cells have cilium, but these cells do not. You see? So within the epithelium, the goblet cells do not. Although, on the light micro, you tell that. How come? Okay, Why do you see it here versus here? Okay, Why do you see? that these are bald, and these have cilia. Higher resolution. Okay? And we're going to discuss that more tomorrow. Resolution is the ability to discern two particles from each other. And the resolution is not great enough in light microscopy, so we have to see it in the electron microscopy. OK. So now you can appreciate, if I was to do a section of, ce of a cell, or uh, uh, epithelial lining, that has both cilia and microvilli, okay, you can appreciate microvilli, circular profiles, a little actin inside, but the profile, plasma membrane, 9 plus 2. Okay, 9 doublets on the outer ring, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and two central core microtubules. So if you ever see an image like this, you know a couple things. It's cilia, and if you see a number of them together, it's epithelial tissue. Okay? You don't have cilia in the non-epithelial tissue. Okay? So that kind of gives it away, what you're looking at. Use these cues to your advantage. Okay. And again, so what we're having is that this is the light micrographic view, and then this is the cilia. Down here would be the basal body where the cilium grows out of. There is one type of apical projection that's only typically well, it's found in the male reproductive system as well as in the specialized systems of the ear. Okay? And these are stereocilia. Stereocilia. Okay? Cilia is important for movement. Microvilli are important for absorption. Okay? What do you think stereocilia are important for? What's that? No? So stereos let me help you out. Stereocilia look like cilia, but they have actin within the center. So what are they really? They're elongated microvilli. Okay? So they are important for absorption. So elongated, so when you see stereocilia, they're elongated microvilli. They look like cilia, but they're really microvilli, and it's for absorptive purposes. And we'll talk about that at a different lecture. OK. So that was the apical surface. Now, the lateral surface is very important for a number of reasons, but you have these junctional complexes, these molecular fences. And this is a cartoon then when you look at these apical junctional complexes, you can appreciate that if this is the lumen out here, that we have complex one, another complex two, and another one three, channel known as a gap junction four. Okay? The channel allows for communication between cells. What's important is that these different junctional complexes has different functionality. And but they always exist in this order. The first junctional complex that we're going to talk about is the tight junction, or known as the zonular occludens. So what do we mean? You could imagine that if this is a cell here, and I have a zipper at the surface, and underneath the zipper I have this band that goes around the whole perimeter, right? So if something is zonular, it means it goes around the entire perimeter. So the zipper goes around the entire perimeter. It's the most apical of the junctional complexes. That's the zonular occludens. When it's zipped together with the bag next to it, it's preventing paracellular transport, okay? But it also is not very strong in that it doesn't withstand mechanical stresses. So I can rip that zipper apart. Okay? But it's in controlling paracellular. The other one that's around the band has these little hooks. This is a zonular adherence. They allow cells just to come together. Okay? And then we have these other spot-like junctions. Those are what's called the macular adherence or desmosomes. And those are going to allow withstand mechanical stresses. That's the apical side, OK? So when you think of zonular, it goes around the entire perimeter. When we think of spot-like macular, it's just spot-like. OK, we'll, we'll show you images. So what we're showing here is we're going to talk about the zonular occludens, zonular adherence, and then the macular occludens. OK, and they're in that order and then the gap junctions. So when I look here, once again, the lumen is here. This is a transmission electron micrograph of epithelial cells of the gut. You can appreciate that these structures here to, for increased absorption of what? What are they? Decreased absorption? Microvilli. Okay? We have, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, this surface coat. But this is cell A and this is cell B. This is cell A and this is cell B. Okay? What we're showing is that this is that lateral component. 
And this is the area of that apical junctional complex, okay, containing all of those complexes that we just talked about. Now, what do those complexes do? Well, they're barriers. So one of them is a barrier that prevents paracellular transport and separates apical and basal lateral. So it sets up the polarity. These tight junctions, only found in epithelial cells, and the integrity varies upon type of epithelial tissue. Okay? Those are your tight junctions, zonal occludens. Then you have your cell-to-cell -cell attachment for zonal adherence and mechanical stability, the desmosomes. So they're in that order, zonal occludens, zonal adherence, macular adherence, or desmosomes. Okay? So that's all it is. Here is a cartoon. Apical, basal, okay? Here is your tight junction, here is your uh, zonal adherence, and here are your desmosomes, spot-like. The key is, that we're going to talk about, is notice that attached to the desmosomes are intermediate filament proteins. Attached to the zonal adherence are the actin filaments, okay? So these are going to be very important when we talk about the integrity of cells. Also notice that we have these intermediate filament proteins that are attached to the desmosomes are also attached down here, which are anchoring cells to the basement membrane. Okay? These are half of desmosomes. We'll call hemidesmosomes. Okay? So that kind of sets up just this cartoon. And then here are some channels, communication channels to gap junctions. This kind of gives you that visualization of where you're going. So let's talk about the zonal occludens, tight junctions. What do you need to know? Well, the maiden player is this protein called occludin. Chlordans and jams are other players. This is very important for, again, controlling paracellular transport between cells. In some cases, it's very restrictive. In other cases, it can be leaky. Can it be modulated? Absolutely. Okay. So permeability is varied among epithelial lining. Permeability can be regulated by permeability-mediating receptors. So if I have an inflammatory response, okay, blood cells will release cytokines, which will cause signal transduction events to cause these to become more leaky to allow blood cells to migrate through, and you get an, a state of inflammation. So although they're tight, they can become leaky over, under certain uh, conditions. Here is just showing that the most apical of junctional complexes here is what's called a freeze fracture a micrograph. What I really want to say, these are actually microvilli, these little structures, but you see this meshwork. That's actually indicative of the tight junctions. It forms this web between cells. And again, controlling para, uh, paracellular transport. But what I think is really important conceptually, the channels, it's forming channels. And these channels can be very closed and tight, or they can be open, okay? So you see it's controlling the paracellular transport between two different cells, cell one versus cell two, okay? And so that means, especially in sight of inflammation, you could have mast cells that are being tickled releasing products like histamine that will go into, okay? And histamine can cause these junctional complexes to relax. And now blood cells that are, uh, that are a circulating the blood could make the way through, so you get leukocyte uh, extravasation through the endothelial lining into the underlining tissue. Okay? So although they're tight, they could be modulated. And you'll hear this throughout. We'll come back to this when we talk about inflammation later on. Okay. So those are your tight junctions. Zonal adherence, basically a belt of molecules known as cadherins that allow cells to attach to each other, their regulation is by actin filaments inside the cell. So one thing is what's inside communicates with what's outside. Okay? But the other one that's really important is those desmosomes. Those desmosomes are the only ones that you will appreciate by uh, electron microscopy as being these very dense spot staining areas in the lateral wall. Here's a higher electron micrographic view of them two different cells. You have cell A and cell B, and this electrodense material represents desmosomal complex between cells. Now, Dr. Kruger will come in when he talks about the skin, because these things are really important for skin. What desmosomes allow me to do 
is I can go like this with my skin, mechanical stresses, and the skin doesn't flake off. Why? Because desmosomes withstand mechanical stresses. Why? Because if this is a desmosome, and this is inside the cell here, this is in, and this is inside the adjacent cell, this is between cells, okay? The desmosoma complex has specific adhesion receptors, but they also have intermediate filament proteins. And the intermediate filament proteins are like rope, and it keeps these complexes greatly attached to each other, okay? If you have defects in the intermediate filament proteins, those desmosoma complexes will be broken. If you have defects of the receptors or antibodies against the receptors, those desmosoma complex will be broken, okay? And you can get blistering type diseases. Now, intermediate filament protein comes in different flavors. Use it as diagnostic tools. We do in your lab manual, okay? There are gonna be sections that are stained for keratin. Keratin is an intermediate filament protein of epithelial cells. So if I want to look at the epithelial lining of skin, I'll stain with keratin. However, desmin, if I want to look at for muscle, I'll stain with desmin, another class of intermediate filament proteins. Or I'll use vimentin to look at connective tissue cells, right? So from now on, from medical practice, if someone says stain using keratin, what tissue are you going to be looking for? Epithelial cell. Okay, anytime you see epithelial staining, that's what you, you'll be using keratin. And we have a lot of that examples in the, in the book. Okay, and all these will come up, even astrocytes with GFAP. We have a new section this year with GFAP staining so you can recognize these, the astrocytes. And every lecturer will highlight this. These are all sections, here you go. This is using keratin. This is prepared in the pathology from in the hospital here. Right? So we're not using anything that's not in the pathology labs. So you can appreciate skin is highly keratinized, a lot of keratin, an excessive amount of intermediate filament protein in the cell, as well as the hair follicle sheath, as well as glands. Didn't I say glands are an extension of epithelial tissue? Right? There you go. So the glands and ducts are staining as well. What's not staining are the connective tissues or the muscle that's here. Okay. Here is keratin filaments in epithelial cells. So this is an antibody against keratin filaments. And you can appreciate very nicely that these cells are all connected. And at the very cornerstone would be those desmosomal complexes. If that keratin is ripped or mutation of the other proteins, they lift off and you get a blistering. Okay? And that's what we showed at the beginning. So you have to understand the molecular components because it leads to diseases if they go, if it's abnormal. It could be superficial blister. If the keratin subtype at the most surf, uh, apical surface of stratified skin is defective, then you have a superficial, uh, superficial blister. If it's a keratin that's at the base of the epithelial lining is disrupted, then you can get a lethal blister because the skin comes off. So it depends, and you'll hear about that again from Dr. Kruger. Okay. And the last type of junctional complex is these gap junctions. And these gap junctions are communication channels between. Um, they are made up of connexons, okay? And again, there are certain structures like gap junctions, epithelial tissue, but other tissue as well. Okay, heart, very important. Just like desmosomes. Desmosomes withstand mechanical stresses, right? So where else do you expect to find desmosomes? Where? Heart. Because think about it, the heart is beating. A lot of mechanical stresses on those cells. So you'll have desmosomes. And you'll have variation of these other complexes that we talked about. So it's a building block. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to talk about now is just the basal surface, basal attachment. And what is this basement membrane? So here is in the trachea, it just so happens the basement membrane, specialized extracellular matrix material, is very thick. And this is the site of attachment of these epithelial cells to this specialized extracellular connective tissue, which then is connecting to the connective tissue below. So what it is, is if this is the epithelial tissue, there are receptors that will actually bind to this region called the basal lamina. 
Now, the basal lamina is made up of proteins that are secreted by the cell that sits on it. So in this case, it's made by the epithelial cell. You can have a reticular lamina made by muscles, fat, Schwann cells. So this basal lamina contains the ligands for the receptors on the endothelial cell, or the epithelial cell. And below that is a reticular lamina. And this is made by connective tissue cells. Together, that makes up the base membrane, the basal lamina plus the reticular lamina. Okay? And this connects the epithelial cell lining to the underlying connective tissue. So if I look at this, you can only see the basal lamina proper by electron micrograph. You can appreciate that there are receptors sitting okay, on the base me membrane of the cell, especially what's called integrins, and they are attaching to components in the basal lamina. And the basal lamina underneath it, okay, the basal lamina contains collagen type 4, laminin, and proteoglycan, which Dr. Newman will talk about. And then this is that reticular lamina. So together, this all represents the basement membrane. Now, do all epithelial a sheet of epithelial tissue sit on a basement membrane? And what's the answer? Yes, all sheets do, not all necessarily cells. In some cases, you won't see it. So you see this tube? You don't see the basement membrane very well. But if you use a specialized PAS stain, now it highlights it because there's a lot of sugar moiety. So even though you don't see it, doesn't mean it's not there. Okay? All epithelial sheets are anchored via a basement membrane. Okay? So once again, and, wh and what's anchoring it? In this case, the hemidesmosome. So it has adhesion receptors, and basically it's linked to intermediate filament proteins, keratin filaments. So when you look at this structure, this is the structure, the hemidesmosome, that anchors it, the cell, to that basement membrane. Okay? Okay. And this is high magnification of one of these hemidesmosomes. Okay? They have integrins, but what's important, they have these keratin molecules. If, again, you see keratin is anchored to these adhesion belts, you know it has to be a hemidesmosome, half a desmosome anchors the sheet to the underlying connective tissue, or a desmosome, which anchors cells to each other. In both cases, they allow to withstand mechanical stresses. Okay? Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I think you got a flavor of histology. I think you got the flavor of epithelial tissue, what to look for, key components. I'm going to stop here, let you take a little break before the anatomy, and so we'll talk about additional properties. It's a continuum. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to start with this before talking about membrane. Remember, activate your turning point for tomorrow. It's going to be very interactive, and um, this afternoon, make sure you bring in your uh, laptop computers, and we'll go from there. Okay, thanks, guys. By, by the way, so a lot of times I will post the post-lecture uh, annotated slides, okay? If, if anything needs to be annotated, I'll post it up. What's that? Yeah, I'll let you, I, I, I just want to save this as a different.